Welcome to the Teach, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, Tim Bullard, Secretary of the Department of Education. Through this podcast, we're going to shed some light about how we're connecting students and young people right across the state to succeed. Every day in our classrooms, we've got teachers working hard to inspire our learners. And I see great school leaders making a real difference in many people's lives. Teach, learn, live Tasmania! Welcome to the first episode of the Teach, Learn, Live podcast. Today, my guest is Kerry McMinn, the principal of our Bureau Street Primary School. Kerry's had a varied and interesting career across schools and non-school positions and has taken up a number of opportunities in the Department of Education. She started her career as a teacher at Smithton Primary School in Tasmania's Northwest, and she's been in and out of school roles including at Dalton Street Special School as the Manager of State Support Service and the Manager of Disability Standards. Since 2009, Kerry has held the role of Principal at Albura Street Primary School. In 2014, she was a State Finalist for Principal of the Year in DOE's Awards for Excellence. And in 2018, Kerry was the recipient of a Hardy Fellowship. Welcome, Kerry. Thank you for having me, Tim. Kerry, do you just want to tell us a little bit about Albura Street Primary School? Albura Street's an inner city school in the centre of Hobart. We have about just under 300 students, staff of 35, including 20 teachers and 15 or so non-teaching and support staff. I feel very grateful to be part of such an amazing school community. One of the really nice things about our school that I celebrate and often talk to people about is that it's a very multicultural community particularly in the Hobart and Tasmania context. Over 35% of our students come from families where English is not the first language. So we feel very fortunate to have a a community that's um, rich and vibrant and brings a lot of special things to a school community. It's a really inclusive school community. I think if the whole world could be like our school, it would be a much better place. So we're still in the midst of the challenges around COVID-19 and for a number of weeks now we've had our students learning at home and in a couple of weeks on the 25th of May our students are going to come back on site to learn back at school. How have your staff responded to the challenges that have been presented by supporting students at home and now coming back to the school site? When the announcement came last Friday that school was going back and there was a date I think that there was a universal sense of Gratitude that we we had a plan to move forward, I think. Teachers have embraced learning at home amazingly. The goodwill out there from teachers and students and our parents and school community has just been awe-inspiring and I think there's a great some great learning coming from that. The current environment that we all see ourselves in is one that's shared and everybody's in it together and there's been a very strong sense that everybody's in it together. I think when we look at it from a whole department point of view and a school perspective and then individuals within our department perspective, you can see some really clear commonalities. I think there's a really strong sense of community in the department at the moment and there's a very strong sense of communication and sharing information and supporting each other, which which comes from the top and I think principals and people in the broader education community are really clear about and grateful for. I think within schools there's a there's another another community whereby we're creating environments where teachers and children and parents can flourish and thrive despite the difficulties we find ourselves in. Teachers have amazing goodwill and I think we've seen that come to the fore in the current situation. So one of the themes that we're looking at uh, through these podcasts is the idea of partnerships Mm -hmm. and the fact that in a state that is small like ours we can build those partnerships. What do you see as being the strength in building partnerships? Within a school context, I would have said at our Bureau Street, we've had really great collaborative teams and collaborative partnerships in the past through our professional learning teams and networks within a school. I think the current situation has created an opportunity where those teams and partnerships have been strengthened and extended in a way that will have ongoing positive consequences into the future. While we wouldn't have looked for this opportunity, The collaboration, the work between teams and individual teachers, the work between schools is something that I think shows out as a real silver lining to come out of this. I know that as we move into the future, our staff want to work in different ways that they wouldn't have explored or been willing to try before this circumstance. 
one of the things that we've done in the school context to manage those students who are still coming to school because their parents are essential workers or unable to support their learning at home. So we've collapsed some classes into, for example, a, a kinder prep, prep one cohort, and those teachers have worked together. The, the privacy of practice that maybe used to be evident in some classrooms or the concern some teachers might have felt around teaching in front of their colleagues has totally gone in the weeks that we've been working in this way because teachers have been sharing the planning, they've been co-teaching, they've been developing resources, online resources to go home together, and it's broken down all those barriers. And one of the things I think we'll move forward with is the notion of teachers wanting to work in different ways, teachers really seeing the benefits of collaborating, and working together and team teaching and observing each other's practice and learning from each other in ways that we wouldn't have achieved, even though we've been trying to for a long time. This has created a, an authentic purpose for working in a different way that I don't think we'll go back from. And teachers are seeing the benefits and celebrating and asking for opportunities. So at our school, we're genuinely talking already about how can we facilitate this? How can we have some more cross-grade groupings? How can we plan our timetable and change the structures and routines in our school to enable teachers to co-teach and work and plan together and, and do things differently? Those are partnerships that, that I think have come from this unfortunate situation that will change the way we provide education within a school. You've talked about partnerships and the strength within a school. What are your reflections on partnerships now with parents? So parents have been thrown into the fray really, haven't they, in terms of very little notice mm. and expectation that they're going to pick up the support of the learning of their children at home. Parents didn't sign on really to be teachers, did they? And they found themselves in this situation where they're supporting learning at home. In our school context, I'm grateful and in awe of the work that, that parents have embraced. I think that's happened in a fairly deliberate way. I think teachers have worked really hard to support teachers. And, and teachers didn't have a lot of preparation either, although those that last week before the holidays was a great opportunity for teachers preparing. Teachers at school have done things like communicate with all our parents personally by phone to touch base to check in how they're going. They've communicated by email. We're using platforms like Seesaw and Canvas. Seesaw with early childhood classrooms, Canvas with primary classrooms that provide opportunities for parents to actually be really actively engaged to see and support what their children are doing. Many of our parents have talked about while there have been challenges, there's actually also some gratitude around the opportunity to understand their children as learners, not just the, the children that they normally interact with and play with and their parents do, but to see their children as learners and to see how they learn and what support they need to learn and to understand the curriculum. And many parents have said, while they're quite pleased kids will be coming back to school, they have actually had an opportunity to know and understand their children in a different way. We sent home a survey to all our parents on the Monday of the second week, so our children had essentially had five days of learning at home. We sent out the survey on the Monday afternoon and asked parents to have it back to us on the Wednesday morning so that we could tweak and inform our learning at home for the following fortnight. And we got back amazing feedback from parents. We asked them just really simple questions like, how is the quantity of work we're sending home? What's the level of difficulty? Are you happy with the amount of support you're getting? What are the things that we're doing well? What are the things that we could do better to support you? And the, and the other question we asked them was about the ICT platforms that we were using. And the feedback we got generally from parents overwhelmingly was that we were probably sending a little bit too much work home and that maybe what we needed to provide for them was a little clearer direction around what were the really important things that we would like them to do at home and what were the things that could be optional depending on their time and their capacity. The level of difficulty appeared to be pretty good and that was really reassuring for teachers in terms of knowing their kids and knowing their cohort, given that it's a little bit more difficult to differentiate when you're sending information home via an online platform. Parents talked about grappling with the IT initially but that improved over time and we were able to provide some more support. But overwhelmingly, t parents were so grateful and supportive of the work that teachers were doing. I think that actually it's really strengthened the partnership between home and school. I think there's a, a greater understanding around what's involved in teaching and having a cohort of kids at school. And, and while teachers don't necessarily want parents to, 
to feel grateful for their work because we all chose to be teachers and we love being teachers. But I think there's a there's an increased understanding around the curriculum requirements, around opportunities for teachers to model some pedagogy for parents that will benefit beyond now. So when parents are working with their children around homework, knowing perhaps how to respond to that, I can't do this, rather than leaping into help, how parents might ask probing questions or model some positive re responses. Those things I think are going to be ongoing that will support kids learning. That partnership has certainly been enriched and developed and I think that will go on as well. What was the barrier to that happening before? So you have quite clearly articulated that the crisis mm -hmm. brought around not a desire, it brought around a requirement, a requirement for uh, teachers to partner with each other and for teachers to partner closely with parents. What traditionally has been the reluctance to do that? I'm not sure, Tim, that there's been a reluctance. I think that for many things, necessity is the mother of invention and people had to put more time and effort into it. I, th I think that we've always had good relationships with families, but the relationships had to shift because parents were taking on a different role that they hadn't had to take on before. I think also the learning at home, for us to make that happen, we had to free up teachers from face-to-face -face communication. And while we've had a small proportion of our children still at school, teachers have had more time when they could actually make a phone call to every parent. They've had more time to be able to do those things. So I think it's the circumstance created an imperative that we did it. The, our roles respectively changed a little bit. So parents, despite being busy and working and doing other things, rose to the challenge and were willing to do that. And there was more time. But I think some of those benefits will be maintained. Let's talk a bit about communication because in the midst of chaos, uh, regular and clear communication has seemed to me to be mm. one of the delineators of success. Mm. Mm. Can you talk a little bit around uh, what you found works for you in terms of communicating with students and families? Mm. I think from, from a school perspective, we've continued to use Schoolzine as the platform for our school newsletters for sharing formal information from the department and those things. So that's been our formal platform. Teachers have used email, phone calls for students and families. We've used Seesaw and Canvas and parents and students have all been able to access those platforms. The quality of the communication is really important. One of the things that that has been really special, I think, is that the teachers every day have videoed themselves and what kids access every day when they log on is then a video of their teacher or teachers because some of that's been shared now and so children will be seeing two teachers rather than just their own. But a welcoming, positive visual of their teacher, hearing their teacher's voice every day has been the way children have been able to start. We've been really conscious of parents' flexibility, so it doesn't mean that at 9am you have to log on and see somebody, but when you can log on, what you'll get for the day is your teacher or teachers happily welcoming you to school for the day, outlining the learning for the day, and being positive and welcoming and reminding kids that we care about their wellbeing and that we wish they were at school, but they're not now, but we're still there for them. Teachers are videoing things in different places in the school, so sometimes it'll be in the foyer, so the kids are still seeing the school. There's still that sense of belonging, familiar places in the school, outside the front door with our beautiful bird tree or in the foyer or in the classroom or panning around the classroom and feeding the fish with the kids in the morning. Some of those routines and things that we would normally do because we know that routines and positive messages and explicit acknowledgement of wellbeing are really important to kids' wellbeing and to make them remain connected and feel like they're belonging even though they're not with us. In moving children and in some cases staff off site, I think it's focused our minds about a whole lot of things that schools provide that are just taken as givens. And one of the things I'm hearing from you is the importance of human connection and connection to place. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit around in a normal school world how those things interact to support learning? I think for me that we, we talk about schools as places where children go and they access curriculum but equally important is that schools are places of social engagement for children and families 
and very important places. You know, there are, schools are for many people the place where they go every day, where parents meet other parents and develop friendships, where children go. And what we've seen and heard through learning at home is that what children miss is their friends and access to those people. And that's, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's, you know, they only want to go to school for their friends. That's a really legitimate part of going to school. All of us, we go to work and we want to talk to our colleagues, meet with our colleagues, talk about what we've been doing. And I think for adults and children, that lack of social connection is what's been most difficult. And it's what's also concerning for our children and our adults when we think about their wellbeing. And we've had some children come back to school not because they couldn't manage the curriculum and not necessarily because their parents couldn't support them, but their wellbeing was being significantly affected by being away from school. And in that case, you want those children to be at school. So normally, in a school situation, we're addressing kids' social and emotional needs through the routines and the habits that we have in school, through the sense of belonging, through those morning circles where every child gets welcomed every day when they come to school and acknowledged. We're talking about the relationships they have with classroom teachers, with each other, with other people in the school. Those are the things that build a community and a sense of belonging that support kids' wellbeing. So wellbeing has certainly been front and centre of the department's uh, focus over the past 12 or 18 months. And I know that you, in 2018, went on a Hardy Fellowship to America to look at aspects of, of child wellbeing. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? We were very fortunate. It's interesting. In 2016, I went to a Principals Association conference here in Hobart, and it was a national conference, and one of the keynote speakers was Professor Lee Waters, who was then um, the Director of Positive Education at Melbourne University. And one of the things that Lee talked about was... Um, the traditional psychology has always dealt with ill-being and when people weren't well and the, the body of science now called positive psychology recognises that it's not just around making people um, not be ill in terms of their being but to be what she called north of neutral. So what we need to be aiming for is not just to be not unwell, we need to be thriving and flourishing and that notion of, of building well-being just struck a chord with me. The following year I noticed coaching was something on my PDP and I noticed a, a conference in Sydney around coaching and positive psychology and Lee Waters was a keynote speaker at that again so I talked to another colleague and we went off to the conference and as part of that we talked to Lee Waters about whether or not she would come and work with our schools around building wellbeing for our school population because when we look at our young people now, we look at suicide rates, we look at youth mental health rates, it's clearly a huge problem and we know that kids will learn better when they are well and happy. It's a prerequisite for all of us. The definition of well-being we talk about is that you, you feel good in yourself, so you feel happy and good and positive, but that you're functioning well, so you're able to do your daily tasks well. And in that state, you can also do good. So you can do good for other people. So that notion of feeling good, functioning well and doing good is what we think about in terms of well-being. As a result of that, we were fortunate. We and three other primary schools, Goulburn Street, Lindisfarne North and Cambridge Primary School, worked with Professor Waters around implementing visible well-being in our schools through 2017 and 18. And we were four of ten foundational schools across the country implementing um, the SEARCH framework, which is basically a framework which identifies six pathways that if you address, you can enhance children's wellbeing. Things like um, strengths, emotional management, awareness, relationships, coping, and habits and goals. So if you explicitly address those areas, you can enhance people's wellbeing. And it works for staff and students. And when we started working in this way, teachers talked about how, how it enhanced their wellbeing. And they're things that you can teach. It's a teaching and learning thing, like anything else. You can teach children strategies and ways to support their well-being. Really, we then wanted to explore the notion of well-being and how well-being can improve student learning outcomes for students, but also for staff. And as a result, we applied for a Hardy, and three of us were very fortunate to go off to the States in 2018 and spend six weeks looking further at the notion of well-being and how we could use explicit teaching around well-being to support students' learning. Having said that, enhancing well-being is a legitimate goal in its own. <laughs> it, oh, we know it has an impact on learning. 
when we look at our society, enhancing wellbeing is a really important thing. So you've talked about your journey to getting to the Hardy. When you got to America, what did you do? We were fortunate to participate in a number of short courses while we were there. First of all, we went to um, Austin, Texas and participated in a positive education certificate course that was run by the Flourishing Centre, which is based in New York. Um, it's the first time the Flourishing Centre had run the course as a five-day super intensive, and it was a very small group, so we were very fortunate to participate in that. What we learned from that course complemented the work we'd done with, with Professor Waters around visible wellbeing, although it was structured in slightly different ways. One of the positive things that came out of that was that we were able when we came back to Tasmania, the PLI offered that course here in Hobart. So Amelia, who had run the course and the director of the Flourish Centre in New York, came to Hobart and ran that course in January 2019 at the PLI. And 30 educators from all around Tasmania gave up a week of their school holidays to participate in that positive education certificate course. So that was a really nice thing that we were able to share as a result of our Hardy. We also spent some time in Harvard. We went and a week-long course in Harvard. We spent some time at different universities talking to people around their approaches to wellbeing and things that they were doing. We met with colleagues from all over the US to talk about innovative things that they were doing in schools. But as often happens, we learned a lot and it was an amazing opportunity to focus on something that you feel really passionate about. But we were also really mindful that we have great resources in Australia and great things happening and a department that's valuing and recognising wellbeing as a priority. And the opportunity to just focus on one thing without the daily other interruptions is just an absolute gift. So you came to the COVID crisis with some expertise and strategies in place at your school around wellbeing. How has that learning informed what you've done as children have learned from home but also to how have you had your thinking extended? When I think about what's been happening in our school over recent weeks and as we talk to staff around what are the things that we want to hold on to, what are the things that we're moving forward with, one of the things that I've done over recent weeks as children have been learning online has asked, been to ask all the class teachers to invite me to be a teacher on their Seesaw or Canvas pages so that every day I can look at what's happening across the classes, I can comment and provide feedback to kids and keep interacting with children as I might normally do in a walk through through the classroom and things. One of the things I've really noticed across all our classrooms when I look at the work that's sent home every day is that there is a wellbeing activity for every class, every kid, every day. Alongside the English and the maths, every day there is a wellbeing activity. And it might be the teacher asking the students to identify which, are, which character strengths they're using to get through today, whether it's I'm using perseverance because this maths is really hard, I'm using my strength of creativity to do this piece of artwork that the art teacher sent me. So, or it might be what mindful activity would you like to choose from this little menu of activities? Are you going to do some belly breathing or some square breathing and how does that make you feel? So every day, as an automatic part of our curriculum, there is a mindfulness or a strength-based activity or a, an activity that asks them to talk about how they're coping. Wellbeing is actually embedded in what we do. And it really struck me when I looked at the work that was going home every day that wellbeing was up front and centre alongside a, an inquiry unit or the PE activity that might have gone home or the Chinese activity, there was always a wellbeing activity front and centre for every child. And listening to the children, going into the early childhood classes and their seesaw activities, hearing the children playing back their little videos about what mindful activity that did that day and how it made them feel calm and centred and ready to learn, it's the language from children telling us back that that works for them confirms the value of that approach. But it is, I think, embedded in our school. So coming back on site, what are you going to save? You know, what are you going to salvage? What are you going to cherish? When we come back to school, teachers will not let us get away with not having different ways of collaborating and organising. We'll need to think about how we can perhaps reorganise some timetables, how we can make it possible for teachers to not just meet every Monday morning in school time for their PLTs, which we've been doing for the last 18 months or so. They want more time for collaboration across the curriculum. Teachers also want to be able to, to continue to use technology in ways they haven't done before, 
but they realise are really valuable for learning. So we'll be looking at what that means for our devices at school and how we can organise to make sure that all teachers can still have access and students enough devices and how they can embed that in their classroom practice in a way probably they didn't do before. I think the relationships between home and school will continue to be enhanced by what has happened and the relationship and communication between parents and teachers will be more... There's a greater degree of understanding around what's involved for everyone and, and incredible respect on both sides. I think teachers respect the work that parents have done and parents respect the work that teachers do. So I think there's been a shift in those relationships. I am interested to hear from you as a respected leader in the department around what's been the biggest learning for you in your leadership journey? I think there's probably a number of things I would say. I think that while I have great respect for teachers and staff in our schools, the, the goodwill and willingness to go the extra mile has been amazing. And I think that's something that, while you know it's there when when push comes to shove, the, the work that people do has been incredible. And I think that comes down often to, to relationships and cultures. So the importance of really nurturing school cultures where people are valued and supported and their well-being is explicitly addressed is something that's been reaffirmed for me and, and I think that's a that's a core thing around leadership that I think we need to maintain. I think the um, the situation has led to a place where people have needed to be able to be innovative. We talked in staff meeting yesterday about that notion of what's tight and what's loose and while in our school there are a number of things that, that are tight and that we know we do in this way, the opportunity also for people to, to have flexibility and professional judgement around things is something that teachers talked about really appreciating and that it's okay not to get it right and that failure isn't a bad thing. You try it and if it doesn't work you try something else and to know that that's okay in a, in a school culture. I feel very fortunate that I have colleague principals that I can talk to and run things by and that notion of, of supportive relationships I think has been really important. I think communication at a departmental level, I think the communication during this stage has been something that's unprecedented and has been really valued and appreciated. The, the access to, to you, Tim, and your willingness to engage with people regularly in a busy timetable and that people have had information they feel trusted and valued and supported, I think has taught us something around communication in, in a department as big as ours that I think has never happened before. You've talked about uh, test and try. Mm. So um, mm. moving from an environment where we used to strive for perfection and until we had that we wouldn't implement anything to cycling through um, ideas mm. and concepts and approaches and mm. keeping what's working and discarding. Mm. Do you think that's a, something we can take forward into the future? I think we almost have to because the future is going to be uncertain for a while to come. And that's, I think, one of the things that we've learned through this process, and it would be really foolish to let that go. Kerry, I've heard you talk a lot around collaboration, the importance of teams. I've heard you talk a lot about wellbeing and the importance of supporting wellbeing for learning. And I've also heard you talk a lot around communication. And I think they're all really great takeouts um, out of today's discussion. But if I'm sitting down here with you in, you know, 15 years time and we're close to retirement, if we ever get there, what would be your, the thing that's touched you the most from the past six weeks? I think it's, it always comes back to a focus on students. And I think what we've all done through this stage from a departmental level to a school level to an individual teacher level has been a focus on how we support our learners to have positive well-being and to be able to learn and feel like they're confident, engaged, curious young people engaging in education despite the fact that they may or may not be at school. And so it, it's what it's our core business, it's what we do, and it's around children and learners. And what I've seen everybody do through this time, be it parents and teachers and teacher assistants and people all through the department has been that core focus on our learners and that that for me is what it's all about and that's what we're here for and it will be really nice when it's safe in a couple of weeks to have our learners back at school. 
Kerry McMinn, Principal of Albura Street, thank you so much for sharing your experiences of teaching, learning and living in Tasmania. I hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. To hear more about those that teach, learn and live in Tasmania, join us at www.anchor.fm forward slash teach, learn, live or wherever you download your podcasts. Why not subscribe so that you can keep up to date with what we're doing? If you have a story about an inspiring teacher or student, get in touch and tell us about it at teachlearnlive at education.tas.gov.au or join us on Facebook.